you could open the Bible to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. I just can't get out of Mark. I guess that's good. That's good. The Gospel is eternal. Go to Mark, chapter 9. I'm going to take a passage starting in verse 30. Hey, dear, how you doing? Good to see you. Let me read this passage and talk about it, expound on it. And I ask for the help of the Holy Spirit. For all that matters is your word. Nobody cares what I think. All that matters. We cannot live by man's word, but only by your word, Lord, which cometh down from heaven. And we cannot understand or know anything by man's teaching. Only the Holy Spirit can teach us and lead us and guide us into the truth. So please teach us and lead us and reveal Jesus to us. For we live by Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, verse 30. He de and they departed, that's Jesus and the disciples, and passed through Galilee. And he would not that any man should know it. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered unto the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after that he is killed, he will rise the third day. How many think that's an important teaching? That's the most important teaching Jesus ever gave, right? And these are his disciples. They've been with him for three years, okay? This is the most important teaching. Look at verse 32. But they didn't understand that saying. And they were actually afraid to ask him. Well, it's negative. It's scary. They couldn't understand. So he came to Capernaum. Now we're going to begin to understand why they couldn't understand. Or they couldn't understand. And they were too afraid to ask him. He came to Capernaum and being in the house, he asked them, What was it that you disputed among yourselves by the way? Hey, remember when we were walking here? What was it that you guys were discussing? What were you arguing about? This is the answer to why they couldn't understand. Okay. They couldn't understand the message of the cross because they were arguing about who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom. S self. Now, a couple weeks ago, I gave a teaching for Mark 8 where Jesus said, unless you take up your cross and say no to yourself, then you have no place in the kingdom. Okay. Now these are his disciples. Now what are they doing? They're arguing among themselves who's going to be the greatest because in the Jewish anticipation of Messiah, he's going to come and rule and reign and conquer and set up a throne and all of his companions will be seated on appropriate thrones and so the, the greatest will be on the right and the rest on the left or whatever. And man, they, they believed that part. They wanted that part. But they couldn't hear the part about the cross because there's a conflict. Now, look, we got the same thing today. That the church, which is way more people than the 12, uh, but, but so many have been given a self-message or they have a self-orientation. Or like Paul and uh, warned Timothy, in the last days men will be lovers of themselves. There's so into so self. In fact... Churches are so in self that pastors are even crafting their whole message in their whole church around self that they can't hear the word of the cross, which is so, so essential that Christians be rooted in the cross. It's the only way. And by the way, we, we are coming into difficult times, perilous times. We all know that. Everybody knows that. But only through the cross will we come through. Okay, we got to embrace the cross for ourselves. We've got to learn the practice of saying no to self. That's what denial of self is. Okay. And, and all, all of Christianity is based on saying no to self. Like, you cannot even be saved unless you say, I'm not as righteous as I thought I was. No, I'm not. I say no to my self-righteousness. The whole thing starts with saying no to yourself. I'm not all right as I am. I need to be born again. That's a way of saying no to yourself. I'm not the center of the world anymore. I'm not my own God anymore. I've got a new God and a new center, and it's not self. Now look, it's not healthy to hate yourself. And Jesus doesn't assume that you hate yourself. Basically, you've got to put self in its place. And that cannot be first. 
But because they're arguing about who's going to be, I think this is funny in the English language, goat, the expression goat, greatest of all time. Okay, so they say LeBron James is a goat. Well, in one way, I think he is. But, you know, the thing is, it's all about self and the exaltation of self. Therefore, they, they couldn't understand when Jesus himself is teaching them perhaps his most important message. The Son of Man is going to be delivered to the hands of men. They're going to kill him. After he's killed, he'll rise on the third day. They couldn't get it. So he says, what was that you were arguing about on the way? Now look at verse 34. They do have a sense of shame. They're so ashamed that when Jesus asked that penetrating question, they literally couldn't answer. They held their peace. Why? Well, Jesus knew why. They were arguing among themselves who would be the greatest, who did the most, who deserved the most, who was the most exalted. And they had a serious argument about it. Now, look at verse 35. He sat down. Now, right there, I'm going to stop right there. That's a significant verse. He's talking to his disciples, but he sat down because he's taking the position of a Jewish teacher. In other words, the Jewish rabbis, it was not like us. I stand here and talk to you, and you sit. But in the Jewish world, the, the students stand, and the teacher sits. Okay. I like it this way better, by the way. I do. I really I like being up here. So I can look down on you, see, from here. So anyway, he sat down means he's assuming the posture of a rabbi. In other words, what he's saying is, what I'm going to tell you right now is really, really important, so you better get it. Okay. So this is very heavy. He sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, If anyone desires to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. Okay, now look, he's turning on its head all worldly aspirations and desires. Let me talk about this for a minute here, okay? Look, a human desire for personal significance. Now it's kind of a tightrope. Like, I don't want my life to count for nothing. I'd like to achieve something with my life, especially in view of my accountability to God. He's given me so much. And I... I I should, God has blessed us all so much. I'd like my life to count for something, right? And I'd like some significance. And I don't want to fail. Nor, uh, and, and I, and, but I, here's where it comes over into the self part. That we all have dreams of glory or honor or achievement or success. See? So something completely legitimate can flow very quickly because of our fallen nature into dreams of glory and greatness and honor. I mean, that's why you'd argue about who gets to sit on Jesus' right, who gets to sit on Jesus' left. Actually, one of the, a couple of disciples, two brothers, their mother came and lobbied for them. Jesus, I have a favor for you. What? When you come in your kingdom, can my son sit on your right and your left? <laughs> so, total self. So Jesus is going to say something very important. If you want to be first... You really want to be first in my kingdom. Then you have to be last. Then you have to be last. Now, this, how, how many and how much of Jesus' actual teaching is like this? If you're going to go to a feast, don't take the chief seat in the feast. Take the lowest seat. You'll be called up. It's better to take the lowest seat and be called up than take the higher seat and put down. Okay? He's dealing what with he's dealing with self, with the great big idol, the biggest thing that stands in the way of being close to God and being used by God or of the kingdom of God is self. And he just taught them in um, Mark 8, you know, say no to yourself. And you gotta be the servant of all. Well, that's the servant. Even the word minister which has taken an honorable, well, in this modern day, it's pretty dishonored, but it used to be a very honorable thing. But what is a minister? A servant. A servant. Okay. You've got to be the servant of all. 
A servant cannot think about themselves and cannot put themselves first. A servant is in the service of another, a higher, of God, or of God's people, because that's one way to serve God, by serving God's people. But the problem is that the older we get, and we mature, right? And everyone says, well, grow up, grow up. Well, I do believe in, that people should grow up in the sense that they should learn how to be responsible. That's part of maturity. But another part of maturity that's not so good is self-consciousness, self-absorption. Okay. So what does he do? He takes one of the most despised people. I'll explain what I mean by that. A child. Okay, the mortality rates in those days were so high. I mean, you never knew if a child's going to make it or not, right? So it wasn't like now where we have a Christian culture which highly honors children, almost to the point of idolatry in some cases. We put children so far up there that we've gone the other ditch. But back in those days, they were in the other ditch. Now, they didn't hate children, and I'm not saying a parent had children and didn't love them. But children are like a nuisance. Remember the disciples, when mothers were bringing their children to Jesus to be uh, blessed by him, they said, would you get these kids out of here? And that was the attitude. And Jesus took a child, it says, and he sat them right in the midst of them. And when he'd taken him in his arms, which I happen to love this story, he picks up a child, puts him in his arms. He said unto them, whoever will receive one such, chil one such children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him that sent me. Now that is familiar but loaded if you really really think about it for one thing i say about this saying is it's the very same thing he said to them as evangelists when he sent them out if anyone receives you they receive me if anyone rejects you they reject me if they receive you they reject not only receive me they receive him that sent me now none of us here have personally met jesus christ but every one of us have met someone that jesus christ has anointed and sent into your life right the last apostles died a long time ago and but yet when you receive the evangelist or the witness or even more pertinently the words of the apostles you receive jesus you receive Jesus. You, 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 you don't, you're not allowed to say, well, that doesn't count. That's Paul. That doesn't count. That's Mark. That doesn't count. That's Luke. No, that's not how it is. Jesus never wrote the book. He committed all to the apostles. So to receive the word of the apostles is to receive Jesus. And to receive Jesus is to receive God into your heart. Right? Well, now Jesus takes it a step lower. He says to those same apostles, look, you see this child? If you receive him in my name. Now what does that mean? <laughs> receive him in my name. That he's important too. He's significant too. Oh, well, Jesus made him. Jesus created him. He's not just a nuisance running around underfoot. Get these crumb crutchers out of here. <laughs> okay. He is precious. Now look, this is the teaching that gave us our Western civilization with its value of life and the protection of children, which, by the way, is going, unfortunately, because of godless atheists. But this is it. This is what made it so awesome and so special. It's all Christian. Childhood is a Christian invention. The rest of the world, kids are for work. And that's it. Or maybe if you got a daughter, then you could get a dowry and sell her. That's how they looked at it. But in Christianity, because of Jesus, and probably mostly because of this story, he takes a little despised child, picks him up in his arms and says, look, the way you look at him is the way you look at me. The way you treat him is the way you treat me. The way you receive him is the way you receive me. Now, let me take this further, okay? John answered, said, Master, oh, he wants to change the subject. <laughs> we saw one casting out devils in your name, and he didn't follow us. 
So, so we forbade him because he didn't follow us, okay? So <laughs> this, by the way, is the apostle everyone associates with love. But look at, look at him here. He's, he's still into self. He was in the argument too. Hey, I just saw someone. They weren't in our group. They were casting out devils in your name. How dare they? Who do they think they are? We're the disciples. We're the apostles. And so he said, Jesus, it's almost like he's bragging about it. I made him stop. <laughs> I wouldn't let him minister to anyone. But Jesus said, forbid him not, for there's no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can speak lightly, lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. For whoever, whoever will give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. Now, it's still the same teaching. What's the argument all about? About who's first? And who is going to be first in human esteem? The one that did the greatest thing or the most thing or the highest thing or the most numerous things. Boy, that's the one that we want to all be like. And Jesus throws it all on his head and picks up a child. And then he says, look, it's not how great is what you do. I'm telling you, if someone so much as gives you a glass of water because you are a Christian, they will not lose their reward. It's more uh, children, theoretically. Now, they're, they're getting jaded these days. You've got to watch out. You've got to protect your children from the world because they're getting jaded. But theoretically, one of the beautiful things I think that Jesus is bringing out about children is that for the most part, they're utterly without self-consciousness. They're not trying to f fool anyone now. All that's changing is people, the culture is, tries to destroy children, by the way. Another story for another time. He says, unless you, unless you get converted and become like a child, unless you turn away from this self-consciousness, this exalted ambition for self and glory and honor, and completely change your mind, be converted. That's the condition for entering into the kingdom of heaven. You've got to be like a child. And, it, and a child could do the humblest service, right? Lovingly, earnestly, wholly, self-forgettedly. I think of little Samuel in the Bible, who when he went to bed, now you think about this story, when the Most High wanted to talk to somebody in Israel. <laughs> it was so bad, all he could find is an eight-year-old boy. Think about that. And he said, Samuel. But Samuel didn't know it was God. He thought it was Eli. So he jumps out of bed and runs to Eli and says, yes, here I am. <laughs> here I am. And Eli said, I didn't call you. So he went back to bed and then all of a sudden he heard, Samuel. And he jumps out of bed. No hint of complaint. Nothing like that. I don't want to go. No, nothing like that. Here I am. And Eli said, I didn't call you. Did Samuel speak back? Did Samuel complain? Did Samuel drag his feet? He's still a little child. He just goes back to bed. And when he heard it the third time, he, he jumped out of bed again. He didn't yell at Eli. So I didn't see a lot of kids yell at their own parents. I mean, rebuke them, chastise them, castigate them. Because the spirit of the age wants to take kids in the other direction. Exalt them and make them look, think that they're above adults and older people. Okay, which is sick, evil. Okay. And will cause them not to be saved. It will send them to hell. You got to be like a child to enter in the kingdom, right? Samuel, he jumps out of bed again. He doesn't castigate Eli. He would never even dream of doing that. He's still a child. Not self-conscious. Cheerful and ready. And Eli finally got it. Samuel, that's not me. That's the Lord. And when he calls you again, tell him, I'm here. 
So when the holy God of the Bible, the creator of the universe, in all of Israel, couldn't find a person to talk to but an eight-year-old boy. And he told him, he told him secrets that the high priest that was sitting in the next bedroom couldn't, would have to find out from him. Think about it. Do you think God still wants to talk to people? I think so. And I think that if anyone has ears to hear, then they can hear. I believe God still speaks to people, but we must become like a child, utterly unselfconscious, um, humble, even doing the humblest service for Christ. So the guys are fighting. No, oh, you know, I'm the first one to stand up and preach in this town. The other one, well, I cast out the first devil. And Jesus says, no, no, look, if anybody come up to you and because you're Christian, and give you a glass of cold water. That's really what I want. I, it's not how great, according to the flesh, anyone is. It's the spirit they do it in. We got to be like a little child. I hope I'm communicating this. Self-forgetful, doing things just for Jesus Christ. Like we, we rejoiced at one time when this room was full of people because it was so fun and you, you get this feeling like, well, we're actually accomplishing something. But the Lord has brought us to this point, partly to see, are you, what are you in this for? What is your service to God? Has it got to be great? Has it got to be exalted? Has it got to be magnified? Will you do the simplest service? A glass of cold water to one disciple. That's the test, right? Do you have to be recognized? You have to be honored? You have to be glorified? What about the secret life? Remember, when you pray, when you fast, when you give alms, don't do it so everyone sees you. Why? Because the Father sees in secret. There is a secret life that all of us should cultivate. A life just between us and God that nobody knows about. But it's the promise is the Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Now I'm off my topic, but one, one of the ways that the Lord rewards people is simply by answering their prayers. <laughs> God's real. It's not some kind of thing where you learn the laws and then you control it. God's real. Is he sovereign? And we're his. I'm here glad you're his this morning. I'm so glad I'm a Christian. I'm so glad I'm here. I'm so glad I'm part of this church. I'm so much glad I'm right here with you. And if I'm given something to do, I'm going to give it everything. Everything. No matter who's there or who's not there. Because, well, for one thing, I'm just so grateful to be alive, really. Anyway, let's go on, because this is a very sober t teaching. He goes on. So he says, uh, he's, uh, whoever gives so much as a cup of cold water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. I'm going to tell you a cool story. I was in Nigeria one time. Some of you will have heard this, but bear with me because we got other people, all right? And I was in a village out there with my friend, Stephen Todd, and, it, and we were way out in the middle of nowhere. And this little village of these little, actually, mud huts, you know. And some teenage kid comes up to me and says, hey, you're American? Yeah. Oh, cool. He says, you want a Coke? And I thought, well, yeah, it's kind of hot. Sure, you got a Coke? Go ahead, give me a Coke. He's gone for like three or four hours. I said, what happened to that kid? Well, when he finally came up, he came up with a dry, dusty Coke bottle. He said, uh, but it was, had Coke in it. He says, yeah, we didn't have any in the village, so I went down to the next village and the next village and the next village until I finally found a bottle of Coke. <laughs> Why did he do that? I assume because he loved Jesus. Did he just conquer the whole world? No. He just gave to somebody in the name of Jesus and because of Jesus, right? And this is what Jesus is talking about. But then he goes to the other one. And whoever will offend one of these little ones that believe in me, 
Now this has a double, double application. Number one, he's talking about believers. There are many, 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 many believers. And there's a big spectrum of Christianity, isn't there? There's a big wide spectrum. Some believers are so well educated in scripture and in the Bible and in everything of God. And that's awesome. To do that for the glory of God, to inform your mind and your soul, to get as much knowledge as you can. Then there's a whole lot of other people that don't even have these opportunities. They're just simple little believers, but they believe in Jesus. They believe with all their heart in Jesus. I think of like the Chinese uh, Christians that all share the Bible. Each one gets a page and then they... I mean, think about that. The, the simplicity of that faith. But it's there. I know people that... I've gotten letters from pastors in Africa. We used to have this thing where we'd send out Bibles and stuff. Used Bibles even. I'd collect used Bibles send hundreds of them to Africa. Pastors would say, I've been a, a pastor for 15 years and I've never had a Bible. <laughs> never had one. They were so happy. We give them CDs and everything like that. I'd love to do it again if God gives us the power and ability, but it's very expensive now. But I mean, we sent them out in the thousands of CDs. And uh, so there's the little ones that believe in him. Now I'll tell you a story and it's been played out over and over and over and over again. A young man gets saved and believes in Jesus. And isn't it beautiful? First love, faith in Jesus. He goes to a church that's basically Bible-based, but he wants to take it further. He wants to grow in the grace of God. He wants to go on in his faith and really for the glory of God, right? So his parents and him scrimp together the money and send him to Bible school. Because they, they're idealistic, man. I want to serve Jesus Christ. Now that's beautiful and noble, but Bible school? Within four years, he doesn't believe anything. Because of a barrage of the so-called educated ones. And this has not happened once or twice. Thousands and thousands of times over. Simple little childlike believers have been assaulted by so-called high educated wolves. And by the time they're done with them, they don't even believe anything anymore. This is the first thing that Jesus is talking about. Yes, I know he picked up a child and we'll get back to that. But that child is a symbol, an example of, of what Jesus requires for entrance into the kingdom of God. You gotta be like a child. And so he picks up the child. But now he says, if anyone, if anyone offends one of these little children that believe in me, these little ones that believe in me, like what is Jesus saying there? That Bible college professor or even that whole Bible college is under wrath. A horrifying, terrible spectacle awaits it. What about the kid that uh, loves the Lord so much and he goes to a little simple church and he uh, uh, loves the, the pastor, he loves the church and it's prayer and it's communion and it's Bible teaching, but it's not snazzy enough. So the church down the hall where every time they have it, it's people getting slain in the spirit and people are just, I mean, just, oh man, it's so powerful, right? And so he says, I got to go to that because I want more of God. I want all of God I can get. And they bring in false prophets and they bring in false teachers and they bring in false ministers. And then the minister, like so many of them, is found out to be immoral. And the guy loses his faith. Whoever makes one of these little ones stumble, it would be better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he's cast into the sea. Well, in the ancient world, I mean, the sea, that's chaos. That's the scariest place on earth is the sea. <laughs> no one really wanted to go out to the sea very far. And if they did go out in the sea, they clung to the coast because the sea was terrifying, right? It represents chaos. 
And there's two words for millstone. There's one that was a little tiny millstone, like a mortar and pestle that you'd use, but that's not the word he's using here. He's using the word for the millstone that it takes an ass to cause to go around because it's so heavy. And he's saying, look, these people that make these little ones a stumble, it'd be better for them to tie one of those mills. They'd have a better chance than to tie one of those millstones around their neck and throw them into the sea. They would have a better chance. Now, that's a horrifying thought, right? It's terrible. It's terrifying to think. And who introduced this thought into our mind? Jesus. Meek and lowly and loving Jesus tells us that if anyone causes a new believer to stumble and destroys their faith, they're going to have a better chance of surviving if they had a millstone tied around their neck and they're thrown into the sea. Okay. That was pretty heavy teaching. And remember it said, he sat down. He, Come in here. I'm going to sit down. I'm assuming the position of a rabbi, giving a formal teaching. And you've got to listen because this is very important. You've got to be like a child. And the last thing that you've got to be is fighting over who's going to be the greatest and competing and vying with each other. I've seen this. I've seen pastors compete with other pastors and undermine their church and vie with them. for. What is this all about? Why even do it? I said it all for Jesus. Amen. Everything for Jesus. Yeah. And is a great thing for Jesus more important than a little tiny thing for Jesus? Everything is about who you're doing it for yes. and who you want to regard. Not man. Not man. And I could give you scenario after scenario, modern scenario, of people that lose their faith for various reasons. It started off right. And I, it, it's heartbreaking, really, because, you know, some people have a, kind of a hard heart. Well, why'd they listen to these false prophets? Why'd they go to these false churches? Well, look, I wasn't very long in the faith when someone handed me a 12-pack of Kenneth Copeland sermons, and I totally imbibed the false teaching of Copeland for the next five years. Now look, I've come to see, for example, I, now I never could buy this, but Cop Copeland would teach that you are a little God because you are a child of God. If God is, has children, then they're little gods too because you're a child of God. I've come to see, you can't go to heaven if you believe that. How could you go to heaven if you believe basically the serpent's lie in the garden? You see what I'm saying? There are many little children that are being destroyed by wolves. And other ways of doing it. Sexual sins. Rampant in churches. And it's all the good old boy network. We clap each other on the back and cover over. And the, the, the little child, though, sees that. And that just takes an ax to their faith, right? But listen to Jesus' teaching. Whoever will offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it's better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. Now, let me stop here, though, and talk about the other track that this verse can be interpreted on. If you think about our generation, I mean, look, America itself and Western culture has descended so bad that we have a love-hate relationship with children. What do I mean by that? Well, we love them almost idolatrous. I mean, the kids, the kids that make it can do no wrong. And if anyone says anything about the kids, man, that is the end of that relationship. And the whole idea, you know, you don't want to spank them and you don't want to discipline them because you're going to warp their spirit. All this, all this stuff. This is idolatry. This is the cause of so much destruction in kids' life. But on the other hand, the culture itself is so toxic. Even if you do raise them right, sooner or later they get exposed to the culture. And the culture becomes an incredible stumbling block to kids. Everything in the culture now militates against reverence and love for parents, respect, honor, uh, humility, you're a sinner. I mean, everything goes against that. Not to mention abortion. 
And not to mention the sickest and most outrageous thing after abortion is the attempt to homosexually prom, uh, propagandize our children. Now, look, this what Jesus said is true, true of nations as well as of individuals. What of the nation that t takes kids into a library and has a transvestite read to them? What's going to happen? You think we're going to survive? You, we'd have a better chance if they tied a millstone uh, around our neck and they threw us in the ocean. We are not going to survive because the, we have gotten so bad. See, see, have you ever wondered, like, when you read the Old Testament, the Canaanites, I mean, they went in, God says, just kill them all, man, woman, child, whatever, take them out. What is he saying about that culture? It's unredeemable. There is no future for it, none. Usually children of the future. Well, children of the future, uh, unless they're so corrupted that there is, the future is impossible. Now, seriously, unless the Lord intervenes, our future is impossible. How are you going to get a bunch of people that are brainwashed into homosexual propaganda and have a normal society? You won't. You won't. I mean, they have killed the kids. Now, the only enclave is people that wake up to what's going on. And, and born-again Christians are part of it. And also, I mean, I've even seen Catholic people say, well, I'm not going to send my kids to that school because it's going to ruin them. Okay. And they're right. Got to give it to, well, credit where it's due. They're right. And even if you do everything right, everything that's prescribed, that's how bad our culture is. I know people that did everything. They have nothing to be ashamed of. Everything they did was the right thing. And still, as the culture goes after these kids and warps them. Now, our only hope is the promise of God that they will come back. They will. But it's not like you can look at someone in the outcome and say, wow, what did they do wrong? No. We're in a nation under judgment. The millstone is already being fixed to our neck. What do you call President Biden? That's a millstone. You've got a president dealing with serious adversaries like China and Russia who can't even do a, a sentence. I mean, it's frightening. This is the, the, the sea. The sea is a symbol in the Bible for the nations. The turbulence, the violence, the waves. We've got a millstone around our neck in one sense. And maybe that's not even the end of it, right? But look, he says, I'm telling you this. And this, he goes on, and this is, he's still sitting there. He's still giving them the teaching. He says, uh, if your hand offends you, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that will never be quenched. <laughs> Look, this doesn't, these verses don't get enough attention. And I see why. I mean, who wants to have people get, gather together and tell them stuff like this? But it is true. It's the words of Jesus. If your hand offends you. Now, I've always taught this. I've always taught this. Over and over again, I've taught. Like, if your hand, that means what you do. If there's something you do, you feel you have the liberty to do, but it's still your under, undoing, then quit doing it. Why? Because it'd be better for you to limit yourself in some way than to just be totally free to do whatever comes to your mind and then end up in hell. I mean, a hand is a precious thing, right? The, 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 the uh, Jewish culture of, of which Jesus, I mean, they didn't despise the body like the Greeks. They believed everything that God gave us is really good. So, you know, the idea of cutting off your hand, something radical would have to happen. I often think how wisdom cried out in the streets here in America. It was not long ago when a kid went backpacking by himself up in Utah and he was trying to climb over a rock and it slipped and it pinned his arm. And he stuck for three days. And he ended up taking his knife out of his pocket and doing his own amputation. Why? Because he thought, man, I'd rather live with one hand than die in this rock by myself, keeping both hands. And that's ruthless, right? Well, what about sin? How about ruthlessness with sin? Because you can multiply it a million times. I would rather 
uh, say no to self than to go to hell. Hell is so awful. By the way, this is another thing. Who taught us the most about hell? Did Peter? Did James? Did John? Did Paul? Nope. It's like it's so bad. That My theory on it lately is it's, it's such a horrifying subject that God knew he just had to vouchsafe it to his son who no one can say is unloving and say, Jesus, you tell them everything about it because that way they can't say, oh, Paul, he had issues. He, was, he had all kinds of hang-ups. Paul did talk about hell, and so did Peter and James and John, but not like Jesus. Now, here's another look at this verse, another interpretation. That why would you cut off your hand in, you know, in a normal life? Well, I would do anything I could to avoid cutting off my hand. But if I had gangrene, then... Boy, would I ever hate this. I would hate it so bad. I'd put it off. I'd do anything I could to try to get it better. Like I'd put Robitussin or something on her. Anything, okay. But when you finally realize this gangrene's going up my arm and it's either me or it, you cut off your hand. Well, is there such a thing as spiritual gangrene? I mean, you could die. I wish people knew. I think you know, but I wish people at, at large knew. You can die of sin. I, I know people, like the culture's got them so bad, they're Christians, that it's not even a big deal that people they know and love live together outside of marriage. It's all right, whatever. You, well, you gotta adjust to the times and everything like that. Do they not see, this is gangrene. This is killing, okay. The next exception, and acceptance will be gay. You go, oh, well, he's still a good guy. He basically loves the Lord, but he's gay. And this is coming. This is the gangrene that's killing us, right? And so he says, if your, eye, if your hand offends you, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that will never be quenched. Now, where did Jesus get the fire that will never be quenched? He's quoting Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66 is an amazing chapter because Isaiah is like a miniature Bible and 66 is like the end times and the eschaton, right? And the last thing you see in Isaiah 66 is people in the holy city looking out at the bodies of the rebels and seeing that they're in a fire that will never be quenched and they're being eaten by worms that will never die. And Jesus is quoting this. And Now, what did this conversation start on? Self. You gotta say no to self. These people who've been in Bible school with Jesus day and night for three years are still fighting about who's gonna be the greatest. He says, if you're where your worm dies not, and where the fire isn't quenched. Now look, I don't know about you, but to me that is just gruesome. That's hideous. Like, what it, someone says, is hell really a fire? Well, let's say it is. That's terrible, right? Let's say it's not. Someone goes, oh, good, I hope I hoped you'd say that it's not. No, if this is an example, then whatever the reality is, it's worse. It's not, not lighter, it's worse. Okay. I think it's a fire. And the problem is, like, just like God's going to resurrect our bodies so that we will be, and they'll be, redeemed from corruption and we will be fit for the new life that we're going to enter into the glories of the kingdom this corruptible must put on incorruption right well the lord is going to resurrect the bodies of the wicked too the body's not unimportant it's really important why is he going to resurrect their bodies to make them fit for the righteous judgment of god now let me take a few minutes to talk about this Look, it just seems so bad, right? And it's so far removed from our time and the sentiments of our time. People just can't believe. In fact, there is a movement within Christianity to deny these things. Annihilationism is being taught by major evangelical teachers now. Why does this generation have such a hard time 
believing what Jesus is saying here. Now, I want to tell you why, and I believe that's part of it. I'm, I'm not saying I got all the answers, but why is this so hard to believe? I mean, back in like Luther's day or even 150 years ago, I mean, people constantly thought about what's going to happen to me when I die. Luther was obsessed with the idea, okay? And someone said, boy, what a nut. He's successful with that idea. No, that's a pretty good thing to get clear, right? But people always thought, now, I don't know. Most people you meet probably rarely ever think about, you know, what if I end up in hell or what if, am I going to go to heaven or whatever? The humanism is so powerful, it's got them all convinced they're all going to heaven. The worst rap star that sings about rape, murder, and drug dealing at the award ceremonies can say, I want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is profound deception. People are in serious trouble. They are on their way to here. Now listen, why is it? I'm going to tell you. I'm, I'm not going to uh, feed you long. People cannot believe in hell as Jesus taught it because... People simply don't believe that there's any being so high, so august, so good, and so true that to cross him in the least way is to forfeit your happiness forever. That's just how simple it is. Like they look at hell and go, are you kidding, really? Why would God do that? If he's a good God, why would he do that? Well, no, they got it backwards. It's because he's a good God. Then what is goodness? Well, it's infinitely opposed to evil. So there's got to be a hell. Like, like Isaiah, I read this, uh, one of my first sermons I ever gave, Isaiah 6. And the Lord just showed me this plain as day. As soon as he saw the Lord... He believed in hell. Because what did he say? He saw, I saw the Lord. And then I said, woe is me. I'm undone. Once you see the Lord, because what you're seeing is this person that I cross, this person that I ignore, this person really basically that I've despised all my life, this person is goodness, truth, and beauty itself. I have been opposed to goodness, truth, and beauty. Where else in the universe is there for me? Only one place. This, is a, this goes along with why they don't believe in the cross as it really is taught. There is a new move now that goes along with the denial of hell to say the cross could not be the wrath of God that you deserve being poured out on Jesus. That would be cosmic child abuse. I've actually heard evangelical preachers try to hold that up. See, they can't believe. For, well, for one thing, it's, all, it's the same as hell. Cross and hell are parallel. Once... They, they don't know how bad we really are, okay? They don't really get it, that we're not just off, that from God's perspective, we are treasonous against his holy order. We have brought disorder into the holy order of God. Now, this is the Son of God. This is God come into this earth. And he's telling you, I'm telling you, if your hand offends you, cut it off. Because it would be far better for you to go into life maimed than to go to hell. All right. And if your foot offends you, if your eye offends you, it goes on in the other Gospels, okay? Well, in this one, too. There, and then he says, where the worm dies not, nor is the fire quenched. Okay. Now, outside of the city of Jerusalem is a valley, a literal valley, and it's called the Valley of Gehenna. That's where we get the word, the Valley of Hinnom. We get the word Gehenna from, okay? Now this valley is very deep. How deep is it? It's so deep that at the bottom of it, it never gets sun, okay? Now, in Bible history, and I'm not gonna take too much time, but I mean, I'm gonna take you this little excursion. That is the place where Manasseh especially, but all of the apostate kings of Judah, erected a statue to Moloch. And what did they do there? They offended little children. They offered little children as sacrifices to Moloch. Now, it's so gruesome, I won't go into all the detail, but basically, they had to have loud music. Why? 
cover up the screams and distill the conscience. People would offer Moloch outside of Jerusalem, the Valley of Hinnom. Now, Josiah was an awesome king. He's the most like King David. And he had reforms. And this is at the end, though. It's already too late. Judgment's going to come. But Josiah became king. And what happened is he was remodeling the temple. And they found a book back there. This is how far they were from God. And the scribes took a look at the book and read it. And they go, oh, wow. You guess what book it was? Deuteronomy. <laughs> how far are you from God if you don't even remember the book of Deuteronomy? What? When they read that book to him, he, his knees knocked and he trembled and he cleaned out the Valley of Hinnom. In fact, to humiliate the false god Moloch, he made it into the town dump. So when they were dumping their garbage there, how did they get rid of it? They burned it. And there's always more garbage. So this, the fires are never going to go out. And what do you get in the town dump? A lot of parasites. And the parasites will eat and eat and eat and eat until they don't have a host anymore and then they'll die. But these parasites never die. They only multiply because there's always more garbage. Now, this is what Jesus and Isaiah are saying the hell will be like. Fire will never go out. And the parasites now, one thing that I think of, like, for the allegory of a parasite, how about the conscience? I've had a conscience that was like a parasite eating away at me until it turned me to God for forgiveness and cleansing. Otherwise, it'll just eat and eat and eat and eat. You know these people that seemingly get away with evil in our day? It's one of the most demoralizing aspects of our day. People like the Clintons and other criminals, there's so many of them, you can't keep up with them. They'll never get away with anything because God is a righteous and holy God. And they'll answer, all right? Now, let me try to uh, bring this to a conclusion. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Now, it would take a lot to get me to the point where I had to cut off my foot. I heard about people like in the Civil War and they got bullet wounds and stuff like that and shattered their bones and they begged and begged and begged to keep their foot and then gangrene set, set in. And the pain and agony was so great that they just said, all right, do it. And they didn't have anesthetics like us. They, whiskey, bite on this stick. Saw. <laughs> it's gruesome, right? But they had to do a tough thing because otherwise they're going to perish. They had to do a tough thing, right? And it had to, they had to be ruthless. See, what the world spirit wants to do is get everybody so comfortable and so used to evil and rebellion. It doesn't even bother you. But it's gangrene. Verse 46, where their worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. If your eye offends, you pluck it out. It's better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes be cast into hellfire. Now, one of the greatest problems of our day, I believe, is pornography. Pornography is the root of so much evil. And the problem is, like, you don't have to go down to the bad, seedy part of town and put on a, a, sunglasses so no one sees you and go buy a Playboy. You could... You got a machine that will access you to everything in the world. So you're going to have to be internally guided. But as I always told anyone I could, pornography will kill you. It will eat you from the inside out. It will render you incapable of worship, incapable of relating to women or men. It can even make you gay. I mean, pornography is so evil and yet so available. Listen to the words of Jesus. If your eye offends you, get ruthless. Get rid of it. Why? Well, it would be far better not to see everything. Like I always told my kids, you don't have to see everything that is. Some things you shouldn't see. Some things I've seen I wish I wouldn't have seen. But there is cleansing. There is redemption, right? Now, I'm going to close. 48. 
Where their worm dies not, the fire is not quenched. Notice Jesus repeats it. Isaiah 66. Now, for 49, this is the part I want to explain before I close, okay? For every one shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Now, let me stop and let me explain this. First of all, it's a direct reference to Leviticus that said all the meat sacrifices have to be covered with salt. Every sacrifice offered to God covered with salt. You cover the sacrifice with salt, and then where do you put it? Anybody? On the fire. Yeah, on the altar. That's right. And then you said the, the altar is a fire. Okay, but look, he was just talking about a fire. But this is a different fire. Okay. There is one fire that anyone that was not willing to be ruthless and pluck out the eye, the hand, the foot, they're going to have to go there. But there's another fire for Jesus' disciples. It's a better fire. The first fire destroys you forever. The second fire that we're required to walk into is the offering of our life to God to follow Jesus wherever he takes you. Now, what is it about the salt? Why did every sacrifice have to be salted with salt? Salt stands for incorruption. Okay. See, even the sacrifice is not worthy of the fire until the salt's put on it. I'm not worthy to follow Jesus, but I want to, and he saved me, and he's gonna put salt on us and then tell us, follow me wherever it leads you. I mean, where are the possible places it can lead you? Into rejection, into hatred, into misunderstanding, into losing people, losing friends, into standing for truth, even if it hurts. That's the fire that's good. That we're salted with salt. The word of grace, the word of God is salt that keeps us from being corrupted and makes us an acceptable sacrifice unto God. So basically what Jesus is saying is one way or the other, people got to go into a fire. It's just been, been, been which fire? I'd like to go in this second fire. I'd like to be salted with salt and then offered unto God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And then I'd like to follow Jesus wherever it takes me. Okay, now so far I've had a very, very blessed and peaceful and easy life. I mean, we're all going to have our little persecutions and little disappointments and things like that. But the point is back to the child. Are you willing? Are you willing? Salt is good. So is the fire on the altar. That's good. Like one of the things that I've learned over the 40 years I've been a Christian is, like you go through trials and everything like that, and I always get this thought that comes to me lately. That's what it takes to chisel away so much about you. <laughs> That's what it takes. If it was easy, believe me, everyone would be doing it. There's a lot more wrong with me than I ever knew. And that's what it takes. Get rubbed the wrong way, get rejected, get misunderstood, get distorted, get lied about, betrayal. Hey, whatever it takes. Salt's going to purify us. The fire's not going to consume us like down in hell. It's not Gehenna. I'm not in Gehenna. I'm on the altar of God. So are you. Amen. Salt is good. If the salt has lost its saltiness, wherewith shall you season it? Have salt in yourself. Have peace one with another. <laughs> Let's stay in love. Let's stay in communion. Let's stay in the word. Father, in the name of Jesus, breathe your breath of life on this sermon. Anything in it that is you speaking, intensify it in our souls. I pray this in Jesus' name.